complexity is everywhere. Instead of avoiding challenges or fearing failure, I've learned that you have to focus on what you can control. In work and in life, when that noise and chaos try to creep in, I choose to stay true to myself and remember who I love. That's how I control complexity. This is the grand finale of Hacker Valley Red, where we're exploring the nexus between offensive cybersecurity and humanity with a hacker's mindset. Finally, I'm one of your hosts. I'm Chris Cochran. And I'm Ron Eddings. And this season, we explored the cybersecurity legends. We explored the topics, the people, the ideas that really make up red teaming, offensive operations, and alike. This season was incredible for me because I'm a son of cybersecurity. I'm someone that would say cybersecurity helped raise me because when I was a teen and a kid, I felt lonely a lot. But when I was online, on technology, learning about hacking and cybersecurity, I felt whole. And speaking to some of the people that I used to look up to so much when I was first breaking in, it's a dream come true. Yeah, it's incredible. And we have a very, very special guest. But before we reveal exactly who it is, we got to talk for a minute about this season. This is the last episode. I learned uh, a whole lot about the red side of cybersecurity, even though, you know, I spent a lot of time doing some of this stuff, but really talking to the folks that are legends in the space. Really, the red side seems to be misunderstood. There's a miscommunications. There's a lack of understanding, a lack of awareness and empathy that I think we all need to take into account when we're talking about the red side, making sure that that information from the red side gets get to put uh, gets put to good use on the blue side. What was one of the big things that you learned in this season, Ron? The one of the biggest things that I learned is engagement outreach, support. There's so much that we could do from a technical perspective. We could build the best tools and the best hacks and maybe even build the best company. But what happens when you don't have people to support you or support your ideas? And also what happens when you're not supporting others' ideas and supporting the community? All things are going to start to fall apart. You're going to have a breakdown in communication, a breakdown in operations, but also a breakdown in people feeling good about what they're doing and who they're doing it with. 100%. When was the first time you touched Metasploit? That is a good question. The first time <laughs> that I touched Metasploit, it was actually the second tool that I ever used in cybersecurity. Mm. The first tool that I used was called ProRat. It wasn't open yep. source. I didn't know how it worked. But the first <laughs> tool that I used where I really felt confident was Metasploit. And I would say that was in 2007. Mm, that's a long time ago. What about you? I would say, <laughs> yeah, I would say... Probably 2008-ish. I would say the first tool I ever used was Nmap. The second tool I ever mm -hmm. used was Metasploit. And uh, that's why we have a very special guest for everyone out there. Everyone that has been in the community, whether you've been to an ethical hacking course, whether you've played around with things like Metasploit, we have HD Moore, the epitome of a legend on the offensive side of cybersecurity. Tell everyone a little bit about the background of HD Moore, Ron. You're going to have to listen to the full episode, but I'll give you a little <laughs> taste. H.D. Moore is the founder and creator of Metasploit. He built it to have a community of 300 plus people contributing to this one project. But H.D. is also a founder. He founded and co-founded uh, Rumble, which is a network discovery tool. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the interview with H.D. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? You're in the Hacker Valley studio with your hosts, Ron and Chris. E yes, sir. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. And usually I'm not on my own podcast being a fanboy. You know, we run into a lot. But today I'm a complete fanboy. We have a legend on the podcast, a legend that is known for founding Metasploit, a legend that's known for co-founding Rumble. Today, our guest is H.D. Moore, the founder of Metasploit, also co-founder of Rumble. H.D., honor and pleasure to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Oh, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, you can't really go through any ethical hacking course without touching something like Metasploit, without being touched by the community that you've basically created from that brain of yours. But for the folks out there that don't know who you are just yet, we'd love to hear a little bit about you and your origin story. Yeah, sure. I kind of grew up in the, the, the 90s of 
hacking things through telephone wires as opposed to, you know, internet, uh, moved on to IRC and all the TCP IP fun stuff in the early days there. Um, and just kind of spent my, the rest of my career bouncing between consulting work where I'm doing red team work and actually breaking into stuff or building tools to automate the process of finding vulnerabilities or exploiting stuff. So I spent a lot of my time either, you know, just neck deep in random bank networks, tearing things apart, finding ways to, you know, pop e-commerce systems and steal credit cards or going and writing the tools to find ways to automate the exploitations for that stuff. So I really love doing that kind of back and forth model of get out there, go in the field, see what kind of crazy stuff exists in the world, and then go put, go heads down for a few years building products to exploit the heck out of them or otherwise provide great data about them. So take us back a bit. When I first got into hacking and exploitation, really cybersecurity as a whole, it was because I got hacked. Someone hacked me on AOL Instant Messenger. It was devastating. But the reason why I wanted to learn about it and do it myself was because I wanted to do it to my friends. I wanted them to have that same reaction that I felt and be surprised and have their CD-ROM drive open up and close and the computer restart. But what was it for you that made you go so deep down this rabbit hole of exploitation, networking, and all of the things like I'm, I'm for a lot of it's just the computing side of things. It's the combination of like, I can write some code that does something on my behalf and it just goes off and does things, usually the wrong thing, but it's great to, you know, know that any problems are my problems. Like it was my mistake that caused that. So it's nice having like that little of like control, you know, concise output. The other side is just the discovery and, and understanding. Like I'm just really like curious about the world. I really want to know what's out there. And when you're, you know, 15 years old in your bedroom with a modem and you're just dialing random 10 digit numbers trying to figure out where they land, you find the weirdest stuff like the HVAC controls for Target, the, uh, you know, have radio station transmitters, all kinds of fun voice IVR systems. Like you find this really cool stuff. And that same mentality has kind of just been the background of my career all the way through for the last you know, 20 some years now. Um, I spent some time doing like scan the internet projects in the late nineties, did a few more rounds of those in the two thousands, a few more rounds in the 2010s. Like I just love going and figuring out like how are things connected? What's out there? What type of devices are people using? Um, um, what businesses actually rely on what stuff? So there's a bunch of like fun projects where we went and took like one interesting data point about the world, like UPnP exposure. And just went super, super deep on that as far as we could to figure out where it would end up. Like what's the worst case scenario you can do now that we've categorized the entire world's UPnP exposure. Um, so I love that stuff. But on the flip side, like, that information is only as good as what you do with it. So it's also good to go build tools and say, great, now I've got a way to turn your video camera on remotely and log into your house or open your door or things like that. So I feel like, you know, it's a combination of both doing the exploration and the research and then being able to actually make that practical that I love. Absolutely. We, we got to touch on the Metasploit project, the, the why of the project. What were some of the trials, the tribulations, the successes, the community impact? What were, what, tell us that whole story of, of how you got started and what it, what it ended up doing uh, today. Yeah, sure. I mean, like any project by, you know, probably a, a young male who um, was not well off, it was mostly driven by anger and spite. Uh, and it's a great way to get things off the ground because mm -hmm. you kind of need a lot. You need that chip on your shoulder to really go through some of the uh, pushback you get in the early days. So with Metasploit, everyone hated it, right? <laughs> like my employer hated it. Our customers hated it. Uh, my friends in the security space thought it was a script kitty tool and terrible. Like it was one of those things where, you know, the early prototypes in 2002 or so were so terrible. People just laughed at me, whatever. By 2003, we're like, oh man, you're going to like arm the script kitties and this is no good at all. And oh, and, oh, also your exploits suck. And then by the time we got to like 2004, um, I'd convinced a couple of the folks to join the team and help out. And we were building some pretty useful stuff. Like it was actually some of the best exploits for all the stuff out there it was coming from Metasploit then because of the combined efforts of like mm. the deep shellcode research by, you know, Scape, the really interesting um, shellcode permutation, IDS evasion work by folks like Brian Caswell and Spoon M. So we had these just really awesome open source team we put together. And it was really just fighting against everybody else. It was fighting against the software vendors uh, saying, you know, just hot patching Internet Explorer vulnerability after vulnerability repeatedly. And we just took dynamite to that approach. We basically built tools to find every possible vulnerability in a given space and just blow it up until it was gone. So, you know, with the month of browser bugs project, we dropped like a new, you know, Internet Explorer every, <laughs> o -day, every single day for a month straight. And we still had three or four hundred just stacked up waiting to go. It's like, you know, we have so many active X bugs because we just basically brute forced the entire space. Um, we took that approach to a bunch of other vulnerabilities as well. And it was, it was great kind of going down those paths and then finding all those kind of weird, obscure things like VX works debugging protocols. And we kind of helped shine the light on a bunch of different areas of like software and configuration weakness that I think uh, would, would have been really difficult to do if I was work, if it was part of like a commercial project or um, not done through the community the way it was. 
So on one hand, we were able to um, do all this kind of like, you know, huge amounts of public facing work, but we got a ton of flack for it. We had folks trying to get me fired all the time, get dragged in front of boards, um, mm. negative press articles, all kinds of fun stuff. Like my employers hated the fact that I was involved with it until it got popular enough that it became a thing. They say, oh, look, we've got the Metasploit guy working for us. So it was fun when that, that, right. that bit flipped sometime around <laughs> the 2007 or something like that. It was really funny watching that flip from being like a liability to being, you know, an asset for the company I was working for. You know, th- I would say that I never felt that way from like somebody working in cybersecurity that this tool was out of spite and it was enabling script kitties. But there was one beef I had with Metasploit HD. And the, that beef was, I thought I was so clever. I was learning Perl and I was learning Python. I was like, I'm, I got my bases covered for cybersecurity. And then I see Metasploit and it's all in Ruby. <laughs> so what made you go down that path of selecting Ruby, even though there was other programming languages that other people in cybersecurity were so interested and excited oh, about? Oh, that was definitely spite. Uh, <laughs> so that one was funny because we had a company uh, called uh, Sync Corporation, which built a vulnerability scanner written in Perl. And out of the blue, they announced a product called Sync Exploit. We're like, well, that's kind of strange that this company that hasn't done any exploit work before all of a sudden has a commercial pen test product. And of course, one of our friends finally got a copy of it. They looked at it like, oh, that's that's basically just Metasploit 2. They just copied huge chunks of Metasploits for um, exploits, shellcode, encoders, just, you know, code for code mm-hmm. all the way through. And we're like, that's cool. It's open source. But like, contribute back. Like, get in touch. Like, be a sponsor. Like, we had no commercial aspirations at that point. Mm-hmm. We're just doing training to make the bills. Uh, but it was would have been awesome to work with someone like that, to, with a company who was actually commercializing it. But they were just such jerks about it and denying right. the fact they even, like, used our code, even though we're, like, looking at the code. <laughs> like, I know my shellcode. <laughs> um it was so funny. So we finally said, screw it. We just basically um, went back and rewrote the entire thing in a language that was incompatible with everything else in the world. We put it under a commercial license temporarily for about uh, eight months or a year or so where there was no commercial derivatives allowed, things like that. Just really locked it all down just to get like our house back in order to feel like we actually owned our own code base again. And we basically scraped the barnacles off that way. All the folks who are commercializing the Perl code is like, great, have fun. Now we got this. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I, I had no idea that, that you did that out of spite. That was that's an interesting tidbit for for everyone out there for sure. Now that you you know you've you've gone through that that experience of developing Metasploit, bringing folks together, what was it like knowing that people were basically learning about cybersecurity, learning about exploitation, learning about this this community that we hold near and dear to our hearts? And a lot of times, the first time they really interact with it. Sometimes was with, with Metasploit. What were some of the, the feelings and some of the experiences that you came away with from that project? Not sure. I mean, the one thing that I never really enjoyed about the security community or even the industry later on is the, the elitism, right? Unless you're like one of the cool kids, you, you don't get access to the cool tools. You don't hear about stuff until it's too late. Like there's just very much a strict, you know, uh, level of inclusiveness depending on who you are and who you know and things like that and how old you are in a lot of cases. So I was always like three or four years younger than most of the folks that I looked up to in the community. And I was never really, you know, in the first line to get the cool exploits or talk to the cool folks. And people just kind of thought it was an annoying script kid most of my career and probably still do. And that's fine. I don't care. But it was one of those things where, uh, as a result, like, you know, when we started the Metasploit project, we really want to open up to everybody. We want to make sure that even if you barely know how to program, you can still contribute something to Metasploit. So we did our best to make it really easy for folks to get in touch with us, to um, submit code. Often the code that someone submitted would definitely not be the code that we ended up committing. We would basically take a submission that was barely Ruby or barely Perl, and then we'd spend like two days rewriting it from scratch till it was perfect. And we'd say, thank you for your contribution to push it. So that happened a lot. We we did a lot of rewrites and cleanups. Mm-hmm. And part of that was like telling them, here, here's why we're doing it. Here's the code changes we're making. Here's why this is easier to maintain over time. Like, yeah, this is awesome. This is your contribution to an open source framework, but we have to maintain this thing for indefinitely going forward. So we want to make sure it's code we like too. So there was that kind of push and pull on the community side. But the amazing thing about it is I think even before the Rapid 7, Rapid 7 acquisition, I believe we had something like 300 outside contributors to the project. And these are folks that were putting it on their resume saying, hey, I contributed this module to Metasploit. I worked on this tool. Mm-hmm. And it was really awesome right. that so many folks were able to kind of get their start in the, in the community or get a job they wouldn't have got before because they could point to this like open source thing they worked on. Even if it's under like a pseudonym, um, there was a p- part of my life where I had to contribute to Metasploit under a pseudonym for about six weeks. It was hilarious. I was right between jobs. I didn't want one employer to find out I was doing some like some moonlight work as I was about to shift jobs to a different company. So all the exploits I wrote during that period got assigned to like someone called Thor Duman, which was like anagram of like not HD more. <laughs> so it took years before I to figure out that those were all my bugs at some point, but it was fun. Like uh, it's kind of neat, like having a platform where you can contribute anonymously and contribute to other people's careers and like, you know, serve as kind of a mini mentor for folks. A lot of times people would be, uh, they'd show up out of the blue, they'd kind of flail around a little bit trying to get the, to get the ropes for it. We'd help them out, we'd get things up and running, and then they'd disappear into the sunset. And then three years later, 
you know, we'd hear from them saying, hey, I'm not like security manager of this company all every evening. So it's, it's really cool kind of seeing where all those careers mm-hmm. led. So looking looking back and, you know, looking where you started and where you're at today, I'm sure just so much has changed, like from uh, access perspective and accessibility experiences that you'll have. And I love the fact that you mentioned like mentoring people from afar, like you don't have to know everyone to mentor them. And that's that's exactly why me and Chris started the podcast. We wanted to talk to cool people like yourself, but we didn't want these conversations to just be in a vacuum and not have everyone have access to them. And, you know, there's almost like this ebb and flow of open source in cybersecurity and technology. Like there's moments where it's very prominent and then other moments where it's very vendor driven and gated and you have to almost exchange value to get access to it. You know, tell us a bit about your experience over the course of your career, feeling as though you have access or feeling as though you didn't have access to the tools and technologies that you wanted to learn about. Oh, sure. Um, Open source has been amazing for that. And you're definitely right that there's an ebb and flow to it based on a lot of things. Um, if you look at where security tools were in the beginning of the 2000s, you would not trust a tool unless it was open source. So if you're a pen test team or security team, mm-hmm. you're not going to use some compiled binary from you know some you know exploitation team in Germany or something like that without doing a lot of research on it first. You have no idea what the shellcode does. You don't want to use that on your banking clients. So open source really was a requirement for a long time for folks who wanted to use these tools. But then you had the commercialization of security tools. You had folks selling commercial products, so you had Core Impact, uh, Immunity Canvas, Saint Exploit, things like that. And as folks kind of got uncomfortable with the fact that security tools could be commercialized, they stopped caring quite as much about them being open source. And we've kind of seen that trend um, expand in the last probably 10 years in particular. People just don't care as much anymore whether the tools they use are open source. They just care, like, does it work right and do I trust the company behind it? But the fact that it's open source and they can look at the code is no longer, like, you know, step one of the requirements. Um, So it's good and it's bad. I think it's a lot of it's been driven by the kind of like rampant commercialization of open source. Whenever folks publish something, immediately all their competitors and take that and run with it and then build something. Like even in my current job, we hear, um, you know, through the back channel, like, hey, this company is like taking the stuff we work in at Rumble and the open source parts of it and then embedded it into the, their new discovery product. We're like, that's great. Hope they get in touch and collaborate because, you know, one way is, is no fun. Like, let's make this thing fun for everybody. But there's definitely a lot of kind of, uh, not underhanded, just kind of like one way open source use out there in the commercial world. Um, and it's a shame that it happens, but that's one of the reasons why you're seeing like these not open source licenses being applied to like cloud hosted databases, things like that, what they call like community licenses, which are really just not open source and pseudo commercial utilize at that point. Um, so it's a shame that's going that way, but it'll go back and forth. My guess is in five years, we'll go back to BSD and MIT for everything. Um, I love like the, the Go language ecosystem is amazing because everything's basically like one of those uh, very liberal licenses by default. You have to go out of your way to use a jerk license like AGPL or GPL2 or 3, um, which are, you know, right. horrible for everybody, including the author, for so many reasons I won't get into right now. But I'll, I'll fight that debate any day. I was going to say, let, let's go a little further into that, right? You now have sold Metasploit. Kudos to you. I, I love the fact that you did. And you've, you've built companies. You're, you're actually building a company now with Rumble. So tell us a bit about kind of like this ebb and flow today with how where you're at. Like what parts of a product do you think should be free or open source? And then what parts of a product should be uh, productized, maybe even monetized? Yeah, it definitely depends. Where do you want the contributions, right? Um, so for us, like the things that we don't really, um, we wouldn't have a huge use for community interaction would be around like how our scan engine works directly. Like it's something very specific to how we do work. It doesn't really make sense to open source that because it's like, this is exactly our weird narrow point of view that we take when we're doing discovery. And it's not really broadly applicable. If we put this out in the community, folks to say, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to work this different way. We're like, that's cool, but we're doing it this way. So it's one of those things where, because we've made some you know strong opinions about how we go about collecting data, the scan engine doesn't make sense for open source. The things that do make sense though, are all the fingerprints. So we want to take as much of our fingerprinting as we can within Rumble, make it open source, collaborate with other companies on that. And it's working out really well. We use a project called Recog, which started off at Rap7 when I was there. That was then pumped full of data from like the Project Sonar stuff, where we scanned the whole internet and made banners and things like that. It drives Metasploit, it drives Nexplos fingerprinting, um, or Inside VM these days. And it's about half of the fingerprints of Rumble as well. So I love that we've got this like open source fingerprint library that multiple companies are all collaborating and using. Um, lots and lots of people are using it, only a few are really collaborating to it, but that's that's kind of the normal for open source world. So that's kind of our take today is like we're closed core, but we're kind of open around the libraries and the fingerprints and the edges of things, which is a little different than the you know older open core model where you then like sell the plugins to it instead. So we feel like we're kind of going the opposite direction in this case. 
being open, sharing frameworks, sharing exploits, sharing information, I think is a powerful thing for community. Uh, it, I, be, I believe that knowledge is power. But we spoke briefly about some of the backlash that we can get from giving information pretty freely, right? I got a little bit of backlash because I used to teach physical pen testing, right? Teaching people how to pick locks, how to bypass alarm systems and things like that. Because much like you, like, oh, you're making it easy for criminals to do the crimes. But I feel like if I had to guess, the the folks that I taught on the positive side, the folks that were trying to protect from these attacks from happening far outweighed the folks that probably went into the class with malicious intent. Now that you've been through that entire experience and you're thinking about open source, you're thinking about knowledge and arming people with awareness, where does your philosophy really land today? When it comes down to if you do the work, you own the result. So if you're teaching people how to do stuff, mm -hmm. great, they can do what they want. You can decide to do that. You can decide not to do that. But it's your decision to spend your time training people or not training them. Um, I feel the same way about vulnerability disclosure. If you find a cool bug in something, great, do whatever you want with it. Like, hopefully you don't go to jail and do something illegal. Don't sell to North Korea. Um, you know, don't put it on the blockchain. But right. at the end of the day, like, you know, it's, it's not, I can't tell you what's responsible or not. It's, it's your relationship with the vendor, your relationship with your employer, with your own set of code and ethics and morals. Like the, the term responsible disclosure has always been this made up thing used by the vendors to somehow shame vulnerability researchers into doing what they want. And no, end of the day, like it's your bug. You do what you want. It's great. Like I can't tell someone else to do, do to do something with their bug. Like if I tried to tell Tavis, hey Tavis or Mindy, uh, you shouldn't disclose this vulnerability. Like hopefully he would laugh in my face because it's not my job and not my role. I don't own that bug. Like just like I wouldn't tell him how to tie his shoes. Like it's not my business. So I think folks really need to um, <laughs> bluntly butt out. <laughs> you you can't walk around <laughs> saying you know get on you know get on your moral high horse and tell people they, they should or shouldn't do things with their time or their skills or their effort. Uh, unless you're doing something different yourself. If you don't like someone, what someone else is doing, do something, do the do the opposite yourself, right? Create a movement for it. Do some other work around it. Uh, create a responsible disclosure framework because that's what you really care about. Or maybe just, you know, don't say anything at all. It, it takes me back to this concept of discovery. And we said we were going to talk about discovery on this podcast. And when you look at discovery, whether it be a bug or an asset on an environment, there's two pieces of discovery. There is this technical experience of knowing how to ask questions of technology or maybe even people. And then there's this aspect of learning, knowing how to ask the right questions or learning how, knowing how to learn how to write, ask the right questions. And I would imagine with all of the types of devices out there on the internet or even at your home or even that are custom made, there's always a way to discover something. So tell us a bit about like all of the crazy things that you've discovered over time, any highlights there, but also what is your learning process for finding ways to discover? Yeah, sure. There's actually a lot of parallels between the exploit development work I used to do a lot of and discovery. Uh, what you're trying to do is find ways to um, as safely, as quickly as possible, determine what something is to get lots of information from a very little amount of input or ability. Um, kind of where my head's gone over the years on this is that Early on, it's like, okay, if I send this pack and I get this HTTP header back, and from there I can see a version, therefore it means this thing. And with exploit development, you can also say, oh, I can leak this you know, three bytes of address space that I know maps to this you know, base address I can use for the return address or whatever you need, or you know, return to libc or whatever it's called. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can use these small information links to get there. But over the years, what I've realized is like, all that's an API. Like end of the day, everything's an API if you treat it like one. So you can use it like an ICMP <laughs> packet and treat it like an API. Like, great, I send, I make this request, I get a response back, I run through some rule sets. I know it's a Linux machine three hops away with this TTL, this type of service with these attributes, or I know it's not there and the router upstream is this. You get so much information that you just like spend a little more time looking at the data coming back. When you look at kind of the traditional approach to like vulnerability scanning on networks, you're really just looking for vulnerabilities. You're saying like, can I prove this thing is exploitable or not? But you're really throwing away all the extra data you're getting back. You're throwing away all the, you know, the, the TTLs of the responses, all the closed port responses are actually really valuable too. They tell you, hey, that port's not in use or the firewall is not in place. They also tell you things about like the, the IP layer and about the, the routing path and the window sizes and things like that. So I think for me, discovery is a combination of trying to figure out how to enumerate a address space or a target space. Like how do you brute force addresses in the smartest possible way? How do you brute force session IDs the same way? It's no different than brute forcing IPv6 addresses in a giant slash 64 or brute forcing the most common open ports in a given network segment. So it really comes down to like, you've got um, your discovery aspect of determining what you need to go probe in the first place. And the second piece of that is for every single bit that I get back, including the bits that are invisible, the timing bits, 
How long did it take to get a reply back from A versus B or from B versus C? That's all just a ton of information you can then extract and work from and build rules around and do cool things with. So, uh, you know, there is this big push to, to use machine learning for everything in technology, including security. And what I don't like about that is it really takes the focus away from building expert rule systems, which are really just kind of codifying your own knowledge about how something uh, reacts and then using that to turn that into assertions and weighting and things like that. So I've always been a huge uh, proponent of building out expert rules because, you know, you know better. The thing that machine learning is really good is telling you something you already know. It's like, you know, you have machine learning classify an email as spam. It's like, great, I already know that spam. But if you can build a set of rules out that say, is this a spam for these particular reasons, it's be pretty reliable. At least, I mean, you have to keep it up to date and there's maintenance involved. But it's not this magic wand. You just have to trust its results. So a bit of a rant there in ML, but uh, like I, I love treating everything like an API, including the data you don't get. All right. So one of my favorite fingerprints mm. is when you're trying to fingerprint a Red Hat Enterprise Linux system or you know Fedora or CentOS or the new derivatives of those these days, now that those have kind of uh, ramped down, um, is that they tell you almost nothing. The, you get a, the, the most generic, like a typical service footprint for those devices are ICMP responsive, um, and you get uh, OpenSSH open by default, and that's literally it. And with OpenSSH, the banner you get back for Ubuntu or the Debian-based distros out there tends to give you the package name as well. So you can say, okay, I know it's Raspbian version this, I know it's Debian version that. But with uh, the rel line, you don't get any of it. You literally get nothing useful besides just a generic OpenSSH version, which could be any OS. But the funniest thing about that fingerprint is if you look at the entire world of SSH fingerprints for that exact version, the only ones that do that are RHEL and CentOS and Fedora. So you use the lack of any other match to indicate that these things must be this particular type mm. of distribution. And then you take a little bit further and say, great, now what kernels are in use in these platforms? And what are the default win TCP window sizes? Now you look at the TCP window size compared with the SSH banner, you can now say, I know this is exactly you know, Red Hat 8.5. And you do that without mm. there really being any other information to pull from. So we're able to pull some like just crazy magic fingerprinting out of the box just by looking at the entire ocean of possible responses, figuring out where the, the gaps are in those and using that to build out an expert rule system around it. And that's a, that's just a fun example of it. What's coming up from that little story that you just told is that you're really an explorer. You're using the, the pings, the packets, the ports, all of these things to your advantage to discover, to learn, to realize these relationships between devices and technologies. Is there a story that, to this day, get you jazzed up about you being on this path of discovery, this, plat, this path of exploration. The, most of the research results in failure and sadness, but some of those are really fun too. Like one that, uh, one that was like sort of recently is, uh, I was playing around with the SME2 protocol. I was trying to figure out to do some enumeration and things like that. And SME2 is a little different from SME1. It has got a bunch of fun tricks to it. Mm -hmm. Plus SB3 is kind of built on two. Uh, so as you dig into it, it has, but one of the neat things about SME2 is it has a session ID. So just like a cookie when you go to a website, it gives you like a big random number and says, here's your random number. If you need to reconnect, you can come back and connect to this number. And, you know, session IDs are generally not supposed to be like sequential. They're supposed to be like random and then people can't predict them. That's a kind of a standard security thing. Right. But for some reason, all the session IDs on Linux um, and Mac OS, Linux with Samba, um, as well as BSDs, uh, Darwin's SMBDX, and on Windows, they all had somewhat predictable session IDs for SMB2. And it just like stuck in my brain. I'm like, okay, if... If session IDs being used for authentication and they're predictable, what can we do with this, right? There's got to be some cool thing we can do with this. So I spent probably two weeks straight going through every possible packet exchange, looking at the authentication, looking at the encryption, looking at the keys, and there actually ended up being a, a two really cool things you can do. You can leak back a cryptographic primitive that's totally useless, but it probably somehow saw your password once before it got turned into like a truncated hash of a hash of a hash um, from a machine remote, from someone else's session remotely by brute forcing their session ID. Another thing you can do with that is because it's predictable, um, you can then use that to track the um, uh, activity on that machine. So over time, you can tell how many connections have happened to the server since I saw it last time, just by tracking, predicting the, the flow of IDs and then following them going forward. So that turned into a couple of really fun tools. So one of the tools would basically let you tell, tell you whether someone else already had an active session on the machine, and it would actually kind of kill it too. So if you happen to brute force someone's SV2 SID, you'd also terminate their SV connection too from a different IP address, totally unrelated to them with no knowledge of their session. Just by brute forcing the space, you found the SMB2 session ID and triggering an error in the session, which is really fun. And that has a weird cryptographic wow. leak bug too, that was kind of neat. The second part of that was like, you can tell how busy a server is. So if you're doing a pen test and you're scanning the network once a day during your two week engagement, you can say, has anyone even logged into the server during those two weeks? And you can easily tell by what SMB, SMB said you get back through SMB2. And the funniest part about all this is like, I was mostly focused on Windows and this weird cryptographic primitive. So I thought there'd be some way to brute force the, the user's original password hash through it. And yes, kind of, sort of, but you'd have to know a whole bunch of other um, randomly generated keys material. So it was difficult to do anything with it. 
But the funny thing about this is when you look at the Linux and Mac OS version of this, they're leaking the kernel base address and the responses. So the way that, um, not the kernel, but the application base address. So on Mac OS, it actually leaks back a uh, 32-bit base address in the kernel. And on uh, Linux, it leaks back the base of the session tables like pointer address. So now just accidentally, we now have this memory leak that tells us how we could probably exploit it if we find another Samba bug or SMDX bug. So just this one little chain of um, research led into so many weird corner cases and potential vulnerabilities. None of these were like, you know, CVSS 10. They're, they're not like ex super exploitable or a big deal right. or anything like that. But it was just really fun to go dig into like all the possible ways these bytes get turned into other bytes and get turned into a password that could verify it and all the kind of fun side effects of it, like remote monitoring the utilization of a server. Going deep. That That is definitely <laughs> d discovery and exploration. And that's one of the things that I've always admired about practitioners in cybersecurity is that they have to explore, they have to learn. You can't be in this industry without learning at least somewhat regularly, if not every day. But what I would imagine other people admire about you, and this is one thing I admire about you, is that you're also a businessman. Like you are a founder, you founded a tool, but you also founded a company, then you sold it and you found another company, but you still have your hands in this technical pot. So tell us a bit about that. How does that work? Like, is it is it feasible to be a CEO or a co-founder and stay technical? Or is this something that you just really love and, obsess and are obsessed with? I think you can definitely do both. I mean, it comes down to what you enjoy doing for you. Like, don't let the growth of your company change what you enjoy about your work. That's really the, the big thing there. And there's lots of ways you can get there. You can hire folks to help out. You can, uh, you know, promote your co-founder or CEO like I did in my case, which is awesome. I get to go spend more time in the tech weeds again. Um, you can bring on like program managers or project managers to help with all the day to day stuff while you're still able to carve out some portion of your week to get deep and hands on. Um, you know, so there's ways to make it work. I mean, early on, I think the first uh, almost two years of Rumble was just me solo. So, you know, juggling 150 customers and like 12,000 users by myself was um, not a lot of fun. But I, I learned a lot of stuff like all the state registrations and tax and things like that. So I got to I knew almost none of that walking into it on the, the sales and finance and tax side. And I didn't do an awesome job of it. But. We, we got up and running at least. So it was nice being able to hand that off to folks who know it better than me once I kind of got the, the wheels under it. Um, and now it's working much better, of course, because it's not me running our taxes as much. <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, it was great to know all that. Now I know how what I do on the tech side applies to how we do our sales tax tracking or how we do our Nexus tracking or uh, how it impacts a given customer's like billing cycles or uh, their uh, revenue recognition and things like that. So it was really useful for me to go do all, a little bit of all that stuff once. So even now we tend to hire people that are um, a little bit less senior than who other startups may drop in and just have them basically hit the ground running and just like eat and breathe the, the problems of that role for a few months before um, either they bring people on below them or we promote them up to something else. So we've, we've done an awesome job of finding more junior folks who could step up and really learn on the fly here. And I, just, I love doing that because it's good for the careers. Um, and you all end up with team members who really, really know the space and know your problem set and know your customers by the time they get there. HD, you know, this entire season was all about the legends of the offensive side of cybersecurity. And we definitely think that you are one of those legends. But there are people out there that are just getting started. They're listening to this show. They're just getting deep into the weeds of whether they're developing exploits or they're looking at IR programs and processes, whatever it is, they, they want to make that impact like you've made on the community. What is that one piece of advice that you would have for that individual today? Honestly, the thing that's the hardest even for me these days is just getting something out there. Like get your blog post out, publish your blog post, push your tool, do your talk, do your presentation, like get something on the internet, share what's on your head, put it on paper, put it on a slide deck, put it in a video and get it out there. Just get as much of your brain out in the world as you possibly can, as quickly as you can, repeatedly. Because, you know, even these days, like I, I still have like the, you know, the stage for I to publish a blog post. Like I still feel like, oh, this is stupid. No one's going to care about this. This is, this makes me look like an idiot. I want to put this thing out there. I still hate giving talks. I still find them like really, really stressful. I find podcasts really stressful. Like I don't like talking about myself. <laughs> like it just, for me, it, like right. uh, even with like a hundred plus security talks being on my belt now, like I don't like it. I'm not good at it, but it's the only way to really get out there and tell people what you're working on and share what you're doing. And I wouldn't have had a career if I didn't do all that stuff. So even though the, you know, the, the writing, the publishing, the speaking, um, the open source work, not all of it is the most fun thing to do all the time. It is crucially important, not just for growing yourself and getting out there and getting kind of uh, feedback from your peers, but for learning, because you learn so much from the feedback you get from that effort. You learn like, okay, I got this thing wrong or I got this thing right. Or someone comes back, says, oh, you really should go look at this other protocol instead. Like so much of my like career successes have been from publishing something that was crappy. Someone telling me I could do it better by doing this thing instead and go, oh, you're right. I'm going to go do that now. Thank you. 
Outstanding. Perfect advice for anyone out there trying to become that legend to make an impact on our community. HD, thank you so much for hopping on with us. For the folks out there that want to keep up to date with you, all the great things that you're doing with Rumble, keep up with all the contributions or even your past contributions uh, with Metasploit, what are some of the best ways for people to stay up to date with you? I'm on Twitter as uh, just HD Moore, um, Rumble that run for work. We've got a blog where you post, you know, hacky stuff like here's how to detect protocols and query things and things like that. Uh, I got a GitHub uh, username is HDM there. And of course, you can all email me at exithdm.io and I'm pretty responsive. I get buried now and then, but I definitely try to get back to people pretty quick. Excellent. Well, everybody has your information now. Definitely reach out to HD, follow his great work. HD, thanks again. And with that, we'll see everyone next time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ron. And with that, that is it. That is the end of Hacker Valley Red for this season. And we ended it with a true legend in the space. But we have to talk about one of the reasons why we were even able to do this at all. And that is our sponsors. And one of our sponsors is PlexTrack, where we talk about this communication of the red and the blue side to create something purple, where we are going to move that needle for our security posture. Ron, having something like PlexTrack, a place where people can have conversations conversations about findings, uh, about remediation, about pulling all that together. How important is that for someone that utilizes red information? It's, it's the most important element. Whether you're using red, whether you're a red teamer or a blue teamer, there's always threat intelligence. And that's your background. Information yep. about the threats, about what damage can be done to your team, your organization. And typically this is done with so many tools, but with a tool like PlexTrack, it's all in one place. There's this reporting aspect. There's this communication aspect. And there's also this remediation aspect. And I think that is one of the most valuable pieces of a tool like PlexTrack. Definitely check out PlexTrack and what they got going on. Even it's just to see how those communication pathways can occur. Be sure to check out plextrack.com forward slash Hacker Valley. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com forward slash Hacker Valley. And tell them we sent you. Yes. Tell them we sent you and also tell everybody about this episode and season that you can. We would love if you shared this content on social media or on your favorite streaming platform, favorite social platform. It would mean the world to us. We also have a community. We, we, we've been speaking a bit about community this entire season. So, Chris, before we wrap up, how important is community for you? How is important is community for even like offensive operations, red teaming, and cybersecurity. Right. When you talk about anything where you want to improve as a community, you're talking about the red side, the blue side, talking about sports, that high tide raises all boats. The more knowledge you attain, the more innovations you create, the inventions, the ways of doing things, the more that you can contribute to the community, the better. And it raises us all up together. So I think community, communication, bringing folks together is the most important thing we can do as a community. Because if we keep everything to ourselves, we're going to have to go through all the same trials challenges. We'd have to go through all the hardship on our own. But if we can learn from one another, that's how we can get better together faster and get ahead of the game. We're doing it every day. Join our community. You can find it at hackervalley.com forward slash discord. We built quite a big community in there. There's all so much conversation and discussion and we would love to have you. We would love to continue to build amazing content and we'll let you get back to the replay because it was such a great season. So with that, we'll see everyone next time.